Thank you so much for joining today. We'll begin the program in just one minute at 5.05. Thank you so much for your patience. Good evening, Mocha friends. Um, I'm Neil Wu Gibbs, Hide Pronouns, Director of Programs and Strategic Initiatives at the Museum of Chinese in America. We hope your end of summer is going well. This evening, in commemoration of the 1982 Common Workers' Strike and in recognition of Labor Day, we would like to thank you for joining us this, joining this virtual panel discussion to reflect on this historic event. Moderated by community organizer Mei Ying Chen, Panelist Rachel Burstein, Director of Labor Arts, Jun Ji, Community Affairs and Consult Consultant, and Mocha Board Director, and Mei Nai, Long Family Professor of Asian American Studies and Professor of History and Co Director of the Center for the Study of Ethnicity and Race at Columbia University, will discuss the history and importance of garment workers in Chinatown in the 1980s and 1990s. Unpack issues involving the union and workers' labor rights and women's activism. Illustrate the economic impact of the garment industry on Asian American communities. Remember stories and oral histories from a large number of families and children who grew up in this garment worker household. Moreover, various archival materials related to Chinatown garment workers from the MOCA collections will be presented during this program to support the discussion and bring to the for more personal experiences. Many will be shown publicly for the first time since the fire in 2020. Yue Ma, MOCA's Director of Collections and Research Center, will also highlight the significance of archives in preserving this landmark event. If you enjoy this public program, we hope you will consider making a gift to become part of a continuing lifeline for MOCA. No amount is too little and we greatly appreciate your generosity. Your contribution helps sustain our beloved institution and supports the creation of a new programming that will bring comfort and inspiration to more communities. Lastly, this program is brought to you by MOCA friends and partners, including Bloomberg Philanthropies. This program is also supported in part by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council. Without further ado, I will let our moderator, May, to further introduce the program and our esteemed panelists. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks so much, Neil and Mocha, for sponsoring this program. And happy Labor Day to everybody coming up this weekend. I hope you've had a nice summer and uh, you're ready to spend a little time uh, appreciating and thanking all the workers who do a good job to keep things running. Um, this year, 2022, is the 40th anniversary of a major strike and organizing effort that took place among the garment workers in Chinatown. And I'm really happy to be joined today by so many friends to celebrate and remember this Chinatown history and to remember those workers who became so active in 1982 and made a lasting impact on our community. But to start off our program today, I want to um, introduce uh, Yue Ma, who, as Neil mentioned, is the Director for Collections and Research and has been with MOCA for 16 years in charge of museum collections, library, and archives. And I've had the pleasure of working with Yue uh, because she is the liaison between collection donors and the museum. And many of the garment uh, worker photos and stuff uh, that was donated by the union were carefully and lovingly handled by Yue and her staff. Um, she has a really strong professional background in this field in China, Canada, and the United States. And to me has really brought a level of professionalism as well as care 
to uh, these archives and these historical collections. So uh, Yue will start off to give an introduction to her work and to show a slideshow of some of the things that MOCA has in its collections related to the garment workers. Um, I just want to say one last thing, which is that when I first came to New York in 1980, everybody was in the garment industry in one way or the other. And the whole community was the Chinatown garment industry. You saw trucks and garments and workers and you know, there was this whole buzz around the streets of the community. And you would never know that today because it existed for a couple of decades. And then after 9-11 and, um, you know, various and globalization, it just disappeared. And so I'm really happy that we're doing this program because it is part of the history of this community. And it did and still does impact thousands of people who passed through it. So with that, um, yeah, please start us off. Thank you, May. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I actually, as May said, I have been working with MOGA for 16 years, but compared to the 40 years, you know, government workers really, uh, anniversary it's not enough so i would like to say um i have been learning uh, working at moga since the first day especially this part of history um i remember when i was in china it was like early 1990s and uh, there was a very famous tv show it's called a native uh, beijing a native of beijing in new york it was a very famous show in China, like everybody uh, watch it um, and with, you know, the movies are still, you know, very popular and active in China. So I learned this garment worker uh, history of Chinese in, Amer uh, in America from that time, even before I came to America. So once I start working at MOGA, I start to kind of uh, reorganize our collection, accept a new acquisition, and cataloging them, put them online. Um, and during this work, I get to know uh, May and uh, Rocky. They both very support and uh, um, donate whatever they kept with them to our museum. And we start to catalog this uh, uh, donation, not only from May and, and uh, Rocky, but also from the earlier uh, uni uh, members. Um, and also, uh, you know, the government workers, uh, families, so that we have this rich collection on government worker, uh, not only uh, photographs, but also, you know, archive materials, brochures, newsletters, uh, as well as our histories. So I would like to share with you, uh, you know, for me, it's a learning process. I'm really like excited, i honored to be here uh, with our, you know, um, you know, history maker, uh, witness, and researchers, and scholars. Uh, I'm very excited. This is another learning opportunity for me tonight. So uh, I would like to start with our collections sharing so that you can see what happened uh, in that time. Then uh, you may have a, you know, visual, uh, uh, you know, uh, kind of um, impression in your mind when uh, our uh, panel uh, start to talk about this story. Uh, so let me share my screen. Um, so let me take a little time. Um, Can you see the slides? Okay. Yes, um, yeah. yes great. Um, so we have a lot of slides, so I'll, I'll go through very quick so that we have enough time to listen to our panel's uh, uh, talk. Uh, so if you have any questions, feel free to ask me or uh, you know put into the uh, question chart so that we can answer uh, later. Um, so uh, in our collection, we have a lot of photographs uh, about the relay. Uh, so this is the 1982 um, uh, relay picture. Uh, you can see only like one corner uh, of uh, those uh, garment workers, uh, but this is only like part of them. They're like 
about uh, 20K uh, government workers all gathered together uh, to, uh, to this event. Uh, so you can see one corner in Columbus Park. And this one actually was taken by our staff member in 1992. This is just like the uni, uh, the local 23 to 25 uh, to uh, attend um, 1992 campaign uh, for economic justice uh, at Foley Square. And this is another uh, picture taken by our staff member. Um, and this one is even earlier. I think this is um, 1973, yeah, in April. Uh, so this is um, in one uh, sign you can see in Chinese 23 to 25, uh, local 23 to 25, uh, you know, attend this um, uh, children, um, you know, the, the, uh, it, it's uh, about the, um, I, I think it's cut off ch children's um, care um, in Manhattan. So this is a protest to that. Um, and we have a lot of picture taken by Paul Kahu and Robert Click. Uh, I think most of you probably already know and see our exhibition about these two photographers. They were uh, working with the museum in early 1980 to uh, take picture of the daily life in uh, Chinatown. So this part of government worker is a big part of that project. Uh, this one also. Uh, during 19, 1979 to 1982. So this one too, this one also in the garment factory. Uh, but this picture, uh, so I would like to mention Paul Kahu and Robert Gillick, they have a very good relations with the family uh, who were, were in their picture or even until today, they still keep uh, good relations with them. So they can tell the name, they can tell who the families uh, were and they gave the photographs, the prints to the family. So this one, Miss Chen, uh, Miss Chen sitting, uh, sitting with the grandchildren in front, in front of the a door with a poster uh, posted on the door saying that government workers really uh, will be, you know, hosted uh, which day, you know, the, the poster on the door. Um, and this is uh, again, another um, uh, government factory workers image uh, during the time this is the factory uh, scene. And this one was uh, donated uh, from Rocky Chen. It, it's the flag of uh, ILGWU Chinese, um, uh, committee. And this one, uh, you know, it's the hand fan uh, on one side in Chinese, the other side in English about the, the uni, local 23, 25. And this is a booklet, I believe on the other side it was in English, but this is in Chinese, the Chinese side is really about the, uh, the union's uh, benefit, uh, rights, uh, and the union rules about the member. Um, and then again, this one is Bilingo again, uh, a, a flyer with hotline number, uh, encourage the worker to report their wage problems. Uh, so it's in one side in English, the other side in Chinese. And this is even like a detail um, form and the worker can report the unpaid wage in both English and Chinese. Uh, and this one, again, this is like a red balloon and uh, a, a crown uh, to show you unite local 2325. Uh, I believe it's uh, used for the relay. And again, this one is um, collected by, actually collected from the union member, uh, contains uh, songs and, and the chants. Um, for them to use in, in picket lines. And this one is uh, the first two page in the booklet. So you can see the actual songs. And this one is a hat uh, and with um, um, the, with the, the ILGWU, it's family um, there uh, on the hat. And this one we got um, from the Chinese sports where uh, workers also as, uh, associate. Um, so this is a government worker relay poster uh, for the July 15th, 1982. Uh, Chinese on the top and English in the bottom. And this one like gathered the notes and the um, 
you know, the ruler uh, uh, about this. Uh, um, uh, and, and also we got this from the same uh, Chinese uh, support where, um, sorry, uh, Chinese support where workers association. association. So they're like rulers on the right bottom and the uh, note notebook on the right side. Um, and this is again, uh, it's a event uh, of um, uh, the union worker. Uh, and so this is uh, on the left side, a woman present uh, the division of bras, shirts, and sportswear. And on the other side is the congressman's talk. Um, and this one is, um, you know, the local 23, 25, uh, they attend this uh, Chinese American uh, voters uh, event. And again, this is the poster con uh, memory, um, the 1982 uh, victory um, for the relay. Um, so this is a booklet uh, uh, for a worker family education program of the ILGWU. And this is um, a newsletter. Um, I think we have a few newsletters to show here uh, to um, celebrate Chinese New Year and also um, announce the, the council member uh, Frey's effort um, to that uh, daycare program. We show the children's picture earlier. Um, this is a newsletter. Uh, and talk about the healthcare in Chinese uh, on the first page. Uh, that was from October, 1993. And this is uh, the newspaper contents uh, about the history information about the International Ladies Garment Workers Union. Um, yeah, this is continue talk about the union's history. Um, yeah, again, this is union's history in Chinese. Uh, union's history in Chinese again, so that that page is about uh, the union itself, and this is a, a booklet in both English and Chinese talking about the workers' rights. Uh, and this brochure show uh, where to buy made in uh, New York fashion, and continue page uh, show where to buy made made in New York fashion, and this is a photograph. Um, taken at the 1999 Union Convention. Um, this is the back of the picture and their like uh, detailed name uh, of the uh, diligence. Um, and this is um, compile uh, newspaper and newsletter articles regarding uh, Unite from 1987 to 1990 about the local 23, 25. And this one uh, continue the newspaper, newspaper articles, uh, photographs, this one too. Um, yeah, and this one about articles uh, in World Journal. So it's talking about, it's uh, things uh, like uh, 16 years, this is the largest workers uh, really. Um, this is the local 23, 25. Um, uh, newsletter again is compiled the photo uh, copies of newspaper and newsletters, um, and this one is a scrap with uh, I L U uh, G W U uh, made in USA, and these are all pens we collect uh, about uni unite. And this one is uh, from our uh, 1989 exhibition called Both Sides of uh, the Clothes. Uh, so and this quilt uh, is still kept in our archives and uh, it was designed by Debbie Lee and made uh, by um, eight um, garment workers all together, each one in charge of one um, panel. You can see uh, it 
show the whole process uh, making uh, clothes uh, in different stage. Um, and uh, besides uh, photographs, archives, uh, and all those 3D materials, we do have our histories. I think mainly in two our history project. Uh, one, for example, this one uh, was interviewed during uh, the uh, archaeology of change when we uh, talk with the community about the five significant places. Uh, gentrification in Chinatown. So this one talk about the government worker and the other one to talk about government worker as well. And also in another uh, oral history collection called um, uh, uh, Sunset Park oral history that was a project we uh, collaborated with uh, the Brooklyn Historical Society. And we interview uh, people who work and live in the 8th Avenue in Brooklyn. And their people talk about the garment workers uh, life and work as well. So if you are interested, please uh, come on to our website, mogaNYC.org. Uh, if you go to the collection, you can see the collection online. But if you want to uh, listen to the oral history, the third one, the OHMS, is the oral history uh, system. You can listen to our history, including uh, this one too. So if you click on this link, you can see. Uh, so it's the oral history on the top you can uh, listen to, and then you can search uh, in this uh, frame uh, in both English and Chinese. I think we have uh, both there uh, so that you can uh, search, for example, if you want to listen to the um, a garment factory, you just input a garment factory. So it will show which uh, section uh, the, the interviewee talk about the garment faction, sorry. Um, so I think uh, time-wise I will stop here. And if you have any questions about our collection, doing research, please feel, feel free to uh, connect to us uh, and ask the question in the chat or, or during the uh, Q&A section. Thank you. Okay, so Thanks so much, yeah, for that introduction and for all those um, slideshow of the collection. And I really would encourage people who have memories or relations or family uh, from the garment industry to contact MOCA and try to get your story recorded so that we have this history in the museum. So the next speaker, or to open the program really of our um, panel, is Professor May Nye from Columbia University. Uh, she's a professor of history and the co-director of the Center for the Study of Ethnicity and Race at Columbia. And you can read her detailed biography in the notice for the meeting, which is very impressive. She's written a lot of books. But um, I just want to say that Nay has a long history of relationship with Chinatown. And she's one of the first people I met when I came to New York in 1980. <laughs> Her mother was one of the um, backbone founders of the Chinatown Health Clinic. And uh, she herself has been active with workers' education and unions before taking on a job at Columbia as a professor. She's a scholar, teacher, and writer. Uh, with really an impressive body of work of her own. So um, May, you are a historian. So I want to ask you to tell the story about why the Chinese women garment workers supported the union and what was happening that created a strike situation in Chinatown in 1982. Right. Well, first, thank you, May, for that very generous introduction. And thank you to MOCA for hosting this uh, wonderful program and to all the people who've come out today. Um, it's a, you know, we, we think about anniversaries in a very kind of conventional way. It's, it's 40 years since the strike, so it's an opportunity for us to reflect. And I think it, this is a really wonderful way to do that. Uh, so the immediate issue behind the strike in 1982 was that the Chinatown garment uh, shop owners, the contractors, refused to sign a new contract with the union. 
The union had negotiated a renewal of its contract with hundreds of employers uh, in the Northeast and up and down the East Coast, uh, covering over 150,000 workers. The only employers who wouldn't sign were the Chinatown garment owners. They rejected a modest wage increase and they even demanded uh, give backs in their health care benefits. Now, the Chinatown employers believed that their workers, who were mostly Chinese immigrant women, uh, would passively accept uh, that situation, but they were so wrong. Nearly 20,000 garment workers, uh, members of Local 2325, uh, mostly Chinese and mostly women, uh, went on strike and they forced the employers to sign. It was the largest labor action in New York Chinatown's history and it surprised a lot of people. But if we look at the history leading up to that strike beyond the immediate contract issue, we'll see there's a lot to learn from it and perhaps it's not so surprising. So I can, I, do you want me to, I can discuss some of that background. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, um, so can you talk about, yeah, sure. Oh, can you talk about the significance of the garment industry and right. the strike? Um, right. So between 1970 and 1980, in just 10 years, the number of garment workers in New York City more than doubled. And much of that growth came uh, in Chinatown. The industry expanded with uh, new growth in ready-made sportswear and with the immigration of Chinese women and families um, after the repeal of the exclusion laws in 1943 and then with the end of restrictive quotas in 1965. By 1968, there were already 1,500 Chinese members of the union. By 1974, over 6,000. And by 1982, some 25,000. The vast majority of Chinese women in the industry were married and had families. Now also becoming a contractor that is owning a small shop and bidding for work from the manufacturers was a, an attractive um, option for Chinese immigrant entrepreneurs because the, um, there was a relatively low capital investment. So the threshold for entry was relatively low and there's also obviously an availability of labor. The contractors used ethnic ties, uh, sometimes family or clan or hometown uh, ties uh, to try to win their employees loyalties. And this is certainly part of the culture uh, in the industry, but Chinese garment workers also had many complaints low pay, long hours, working in uh, terrible conditions in dilapidated lofts that were too hot in the summer and too cold in the winter. During the 70s, many workers joined the union, uh, ironically, at the encouragement of the contractors, who, who at the time could only get jobs from the manufacturers if they had a union shop. But for the workers, the key benefit for being in the union was that they had health benefits, health care insurance, and uh, for not only for themselves, but for their families. And this was a huge improvement in their, um, their daily lives and their, their social condition. In fact, it was practically the only source of health, of health insurance uh, in the community. Starting in the late 60s, the union became more responsive to Chinese workers' needs as their numbers in the union grew. Now, the ILG has a very long history of what we call social unionism. That is, in addition to uh, defending workers' economic rights, they also provided services and cultural activities for their members. In 1968, the union started to offer English classes for its Chinese members. And by 1974, over 1,000 members were taking part. It published its newspaper in Chinese. And as Yue showed in her slideshow, uh, all of its materials were uh, translated with not just the newspaper, but informational bulletins, um, et cetera, et cetera. And later it added a women's singing group and in 1983 opened a child care center. But I think at the same time, it, it, it has been said that there were very few Chinese organizers and business agents, the people who work directly for the union who were responsible for enforcing the contracts. Many workers felt that these business agents were too close to the employers and did not do enough to represent the interests of the workers. 
But that started to change in the 70s. There was organizing in the shops and workers demanded better representation. I remember Connie Ling as one of those people. You know, um, they, they, uh, people like Connie were elected as shop chair ladies and then later went to work full time for the union. But also I think it's important to point out that into this mix, there were Chinese American activists from the 1970s Asian American movement of students and young people. These young people were going into the factories and into the unions to organize. They were part of a generation of activists, many of them recent college graduates who got jobs as social workers, housing advocates, drug counselors and the like, as funds from the Lyndon Johnson era's war on poverty began to trickle into Chinatown and funded new agencies like CPC, Two Bridges, Project Reach, et cetera and reinvigorated some of the older settlement houses like Hamilton Madison. These organizations fostered cross-generational interactions and provided services, education, and mobilization around civil rights. In my view, this was a transformation of the infrastructure of Chinatown and the ILGW part was definitely a part of that social transformation. So these trends all came together in 1982 when the Chinese bosses refused to sign the contract. They were shocked by the strike, by the workers' show of force and their solidarity, and they caved almost immediately. And I just want to comment that, you know, May started out by uh, observing how you don't see the same traces of the, you don't see the industry uh, as large and as uh, present in the community today. And that's actually, um, uh, it's, that's a long process, right? Even in the 80s, there were, um, there were uh, more and more non-union shops by the late 80s and certainly in the 90s. Um, and obviously 9-11 didn't help that situa situation. But you know, when you are trying to represent workers in, in contract shops, it's very difficult because the big employers, the manufacturers uh, pass all the risk to the contractors and it's very hard to hold them accountable. And one of the things I wanted to point out um, before I wrap up is I noticed in Vie's uh, slideshow, she had, uh, it may not have been noticeable to people because it went by fairly quickly, but there was a, 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 a poster or a leaflet or a booklet, but it said a uh, garment workers center. Now, if I recall, that was a union project set up in Sunset Park I think in the late 80s or early 90s, and it was a, a non-traditional, it was an innovative strategy to organize garment workers, but not necessarily in union shops. It recognized that not all workers were in the union and it had a more community-based and community orientation towards reaching them and to organizing them. So I think that this history is really important because it shows that it's not only militancy, and solidarity, but also creativity on the part of the garment workers and, and the activists that worked amongst them. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up there. Um, I do want to well, mention that. Yeah, yeah. yeah you have one another last, question? Yeah, one last question was okay. to ask you to talk about, yeah, talk about the uh, photo exhibit and right. programs that will come up in the fall in Colombia. Right, so uh, May and I were talking about the 40th anniversary of several months ago. And, um, and so we, we have organized some events up at Columbia University and they're all open to the public. There'll be a, uh, a photo exhibit in the gallery at the Ethnic Studies Center uh, on the garment workers uh, and their strike in 1982 with photos uh, from the union, also some photos by Corky Lee um, and others. And that uh, will be opening on September 22nd. I'll put the information in the chat. Um, we welcome you to come either to the opening or to come anytime uh, through the end of the year uh, to see those photos. They're wonderful. And on October 19th, uh, in the late afternoon, we're going to have a program at Columbia featuring, um, I think, three people who, um, who grew up in garment workers' families. Um, and one of them, uh, went to the garment workers child care center as a kid and now works in the, in the union's garment uh, child care center and there'll be cultural performances so this will be uh, I think a continuation maybe of, of today's discussion 
with a focus on what it meant to grow up uh, in a garment industry household uh, in the 80s and the kind of impact it had on people's lives. So I'll put that information in the chat and we welcome all of you to come. So thank you. Okay, thank you very, very much, May. And um, yeah, I just want to let people know that if you do have questions or comments, please put them in the chat. Uh, Neil is gonna manage that after all these talks. Um, and we'll move on to our next speaker who is exactly that. She grew up in a family of, uh, her mom was a garment worker for a long time and she grew up in the community in Chinatown with many siblings. And her name is June G. Um, June is a community affairs and strategic partnership consultant and a member of MOCA's board for a very long time. And I know June really as a major, a longtime Chinatown leader and network builder and very outstanding because, you know, one of few very, out, well, not very few, but one of the outspoken women leaders in our community and perhaps inspired by those voices that came up in Columbus Park in 1982. Um, her mom was a factory worker who was active in the union and later both her parents as retirees were very, very active in the Senior Citizen Center Project Open Door. And so I wanted to ask June to tell her story about what it was like growing up, where did your family live, uh, what was your average day like? Uh, she recently reconnected with siblings to try to piece together the story about growing up in a garment worker family and it sounded really wonderful. Well, May, thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this very important discussion. Um, my family came in the mid 60s. Um, we were, uh, at that time, we were a family of six. Uh, about less than two months after we arrived, my mother gave birth to my younger brother, my youngest brother. Uh, we're, we're really seven years apart, so there's quite a bit in terms of age difference there. But I, I, I was trying to work on my memory and um, I'm piecing it together. And I do remember that um, I was really under the care of my older brother, who was four years older than me. And at that time he was 11. And then my other brother, he was uh, nine and I was seven. And the three of us pretty much were hanging out with each other. And I do have an older sister, but she was doing her own thing. Um, so it was just the three of us. And we, I remember one day we were home because mom was at work. Uh, we decided to make candy. And we took the walk out, we put sugar and oil and we almost set the apartment on fire. I think after that incident, mom needed to, to um, have some sort of care for us because there was no adults around. And so mom and dad decided to put us in Chinese school. And back then in the 60s, it, Chinese school was not one day on the weekend. It was five days a week. So we would go to regular school. And after that, we would have to rush home, switch our book bags, and then run into Chinatown. We lived at that time on Grand Street, Grand and Pitt, which was outside of Chinatown. So it was pretty much the more of a the Jewish community. But from Grand Street, we would have to rush to um, um, CCBA, the Chinese school, Wat Hill. And we were doing that five days a week. Um, it got to the point where I was not being cared for in the proper ways. And then mom noticed that and decided to take us out completely. Not, I mean, that was one reason, but the other reason was also financially. It cost money to put us in school. So it was an additional financial burden for them. So we ended up um, going up to the garment factory. Um, but in between that, uh, as I was trying to piece my history, my memory, my younger brother that I mentioned, he's seven years younger than me. We remember that there was a baby in the bin next to her sewing machine. So mom must have brought him to the workplace and she would care for him while she was doing her work. I think that lasted for maybe a couple of years. And then my grandparents 
uh, was able to take care of him as he got older. But while we were in the, in the we call it the factory, uh, while we're in the factory, we just ran around. The, you know, little kids, we, we had nothing really to do, did our homework. We helped the, the old ladies cut threads. We helped the ladies and the, the, the older men bag clothes. Somewhere along this timeline, my older brother got recruited and he was employed by the garment factory. And by the time he was 15, he was already, um, you can say on the payroll, but I think he was paid off the books. Um, he was not, you know, uh, legit. Um, he reminded me, um, he said, you know what, I remember, he said, I remember being sent to Midtown uh, Manhattan by the bossy, the boss of the garment factory to deliver packages to Midtown to um, Jewish people. And at the time he was 15 and he said that was the very first time he was exposed to alcohol. And I asked him, well, what do you mean? He said, when he was up there, the Jewish gentleman would tell him, you're a man. Here's a drink, you know, you drink with us. And, and my brother came back and said, you know what? This is not something that he was ever exposed to, nor did he ever expect that it would happen to him. Um, but for most of us, I, I think this is not a, a unique story. There are so many of us that grew up in this kind of household where the parents are working six days a week, usually 10 to 12 hours a day, and no adults, uh, no adult supervision. Um, as I got older, and I'm, I'm listening to what May was saying and going through that timeline, you know, I, I remember as I got older, um, I told my mother, I said, you know, um, why are you working? You know, you, you can stop working. The condition here is so bad. Um, I found out that a lot of women um, had urinary tract infections because many of them were not going to the bathroom. Um, everything was piecework. So they just sat at the machine constantly churning out. And I told my mother that this is not where we want you to be. And my mother's answer, I still remember her answer. She said, look, if I don't do it, somebody else will take the job. And so more or less, she, she had like really no choice but to continue to work. And tying this thought to 1982, um, the garment workers are, are, are all her friends. They're her second family, really her second family. Mom was not political. She was a very um, friendly person. Everyone loved her. She started out as a seamstress, um, but she became, she got, I would think she got promoted because she became the floor lady. The floor lady are the ladies that walked around, I think, counting clothes or, or, or supervising. Um, she was never political, but I think when 82 or, or in the midst of that, um, I think some activism grew within her because we, we constantly, uh, the children constantly told her, you need to leave. This is not a place, it's not healthy, the air is bad, you know. Um, but I think with the garment workers as her family, she never wanted to leave her family. Mm -hmm. It was such a big part of her. Um, you talk about how the union had activities. Well, you know what, moms, a lot of her activities was with the union, um, the weekend trips. Uh, and she took my little brother on those weekend outings. Um, it, was, it was a time for her to be amongst her friends. Um, the kids now, we, the kids are, are grown. We're now, you know, um, watching out for mom, but mom just didn't want to listen. She was so close to her garment friends that she continued to work, even though we, we insisted that she consider leaving. Um, so, so again, my story is not as unique, you know, as one would think. Uh, I think many children from that period, uh, especially I think in their 60s, because there weren't too many um, Chinese families yet. We came in 1964. And it, where we lived, there was only one other Chinese family. They were Shanghainese. They were not Khoisan. They were a Shanghainese family. Um, so it was a small group of people. Um, but as, as uh, after 65, as Nate uh, um, said, 
the immigration, the immigration doors open and more and more arrivals and more and more people ended up in the garment factory and more and more children ended up in the garment factory. Uh, many of them spent probably most of their days there. Uh, we did. I, I think I was in the garment factory hanging out with mom until maybe at the age of maybe nine or 10. Um, and at that point, you know, I think I was old enough and my brothers were old enough that we were able to care for ourselves. But for my mother, it was like part two because I have a brother who's seven years younger. So for her, it was like a repeat. So one group of kids came through it. Now she's got the second. So um, <laughs> that's pretty much, you know, the immigrant story in, in the garment factory for, for kids. Uh, and I will tell you, it, it was, we, 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 if I, when I look back, it, I learned a lot, actually. I never thought of it until recently when, you know, this topic came up, but I really learned a lot. Um, um, there are friends that I still have from when we were in the garment factory, but I never really thought of them as growing up in the garment factory. So maybe that's, that's so the last story. Yeah, last question, June. Um, were you there? Do you remember 1982? And then a follow-up question is, I, I remember your mom because when she was in the senior center, she used to be, I guess, the outreach person to get me or the union to support this and that when the senior center was having rallies and fights for their space. Um, how did your parents become so active with the senior center? Well, you know, after... My father retired first. I think mom probably mm -hmm. retired around maybe 1996, around the age of 70. She was working beyond like the 65. Um, mm -hmm. um, and as I mentioned, the, the garment workers are her family. So many of them mm -hmm. after retirement, they end up going to the senior center. Um, mom mm -hmm. had a nickname and it was in, in Chinese, it was Dai San Ping. Lao mouth ping. She had a voice. She had a voice. She had a, she, she, she definitely has got a personality. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, right? um, because yeah. of her personality. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because of her personality yeah. and, and her wanting to be with people. Okay. Um, she ended up at the senior center taking on more of a leadership role. She was not mm -hmm. someone that was gonna sit and just you know, do the typical thing. Uh, my father, surprisingly, he was in, he was in the restaurant business. Um, he retired and joined my mom at um, Project Open Door. Because mm -hmm. he was a chef, uh, he was a chef, um, he decided to volunteer in the kitchen. So he started mm -hmm. cooking meals um, at the center and they both joined the chorus. Yeah. We were surprised that mom and dad joined the chorus. And I thought it was the cutest. It was like the cutest. They wore their little, you know, uh, costumes and they perform. That was a yeah. surprise to us because we never saw that coming. All right. <laughs> but, but because mom is always someone who's very outgoing um, and dad is more of a quiet one, he sort of followed mom. Um, and they did things together at the center. It gave them, they, it gave them something to look forward to. And this mm -hmm. was something that they were passionate about. Okay, thanks very much, June. I do remember your mom and dad singing and dancing to the chorus line music. It was we, very we, 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 were, we were so surprised. <laughs> I know. Okay, well, thank you very much. And please, again, if anyone in the audience audience has questions, put them into the chat and uh, we'll send them to the right person to respond. So our final speaker is, is a, has become a really dear friend to me this year, especially. Um, Rachel Bernstein is the director of Labor Arts, which is a nonprofit um, platform that connects labor worker workers and cultural projects and she has been a really key collaborator and colleague on all the events and exhibits about the 1982 garment workers this year in the 40th anniversary and she um i first met rachel a long time ago as the author of a book about workers called 
ordinary people, extraordinary lives. And that has continued to be an inspiration and theme. You know, when we talk about a lot of workers or June saying, you know, her parents were not political. You know, none of the workers were particularly, you know, really educated or sophisticated politically, but they really led extraordinary lives and especially collectively the 1982 strike really provided an example of solidarity and, and worker um, spirit that really impacted the community as well as the union. So I wanna ask Rachel to talk about labor arts. What is it? And her background, which is quite extensive in archive arts and history and teaching. So Rachel. Thank you, May. Um, yes, I've, uh, May has drawn me into this anniversary year in <laughs> ever so many ways, and I've learned so much. Um, and so the Ordinary People, Extraordinary Lives book, which was recently reissued in paperback, started as a documentation project in the early 1990s with the Robert F. Wagner Labor Archives. And that's um, something I worked on with Deborah Bernhardt, who was the head of the archives and the co-author of the book. And so after the documentation project, reaching out to community groups to talk about what records they had, we made an exhibit called Ordinary People, Extraordinary Lives, um, and then a book. And so I really came to the Chinatown garment workers through the earlier Jewish and Italian immigrant garment workers of the early 20th century, because I've always been a student of New York City history and the garment industry has been at the center of that for such a long time. So, um, so I came to it via those early garment workers and the story of the Triangle Fire and the huge mobilization that followed. Um, and also through the story of the Chinese hand laundry workers, because those exclusion acts didn't just keep women, uh, Chinese women immigrants out and a lot of Chinese people out, but it also limited the occupational choices. And so the laundry work uh, and restaurant work were the two occupations for the men. Um, so following this project and following this story of what jobs immigrants found when they came to New York City, um, led from early immigration uh, in, in the Lower East Side garment industry to the Chinatown garment workers stories. Um, and I met May very early on in that project um, while working with Deborah, Deborah at the Wagner Archives um, and teaching public history in the history department. And uh, so we started collecting stories and oral histories. And then one of the natural outgrowths of the Ordinary People Project um, was labor arts, um, because the thought was that if you have images, you can reach a broader audience and that there's this really rich cultural history um, from the labor movement that's not as well known as it should be. Um, and so the, the book has a lot of photographs, but labor arts as an online museum features paintings and songs and um, flyers and leaflets that are uh, meant to be ephemeral, but end up being really visually interesting and striking. And they weren't often meant to be saved, but um, we, we're really happy to the extent that we've captured them and put them up for people to use and look at. Uh, labor Arts, so Labor Arts has an online museum. One of the early exhibits um, is about the culture of solidarity in the ILGWU. And May worked on, helped us with that exhibit many years ago. It features, among other things, these extraordinary quilts that garment workers made to commemorate their work and their activism. And we're gonna have a photo of one of them in the uh, exhibit at Columbia. Um, so Labor Arts has an online museum and also does uh, other kinds of events and projects. And one of them 
is the Clara Wemlich Awards honoring women who are lifelong activists um, every year, every spring. And Connie Ling was one of the early honorees in that program. And so were a couple of other um, veterans of the 1982 strike, um, which has been really extraordinary. We're having their stories as part of this. Another thing we do is a contest called Making Work Visible, a writing contest for CUNY students with cash prizes. If anybody knows a CUNY student, go to Labor Arts um, and tell the student about it. The deadline is in October. So those are just some of the Labor Arts uh, projects um, that we do. Yeah, so uh, Rachel, shifting gears a little bit, um, what are some of the key lessons that you've learned or that you've taken uh, out to people about the 1982 strike and this whole experience? And how, how, how and why did you become interested in this? I have well, to say, Rachel has spent a lot more time on this than you could ever imagine for somebody <laughs> who, who wasn't from Chinatown and wasn't from the ILGWU. It's true. Uh, yeah, well, like I said, it's at this core of New York City labor history, which is something I've always been interested in. But one of the reasons I've been so enthusiastic about the uh, series of, I think it's almost a dozen now, anniversary events this year, um, is that the key lesson to me from this strike seems to be something we need at this moment in history more than ever which is about people who are traditionally quiet um, and unheard banding together and making, making change, um, building coalitions, persisting, making a difference, and sharing those stories with a new generation and with a broader audience uh, has been, uh, you know, has made it all worthwhile. And I have a quote from a, that I want to read, a short quote. It's a comment from a Brooklyn College student who was interning with Labor Arts and came to this amazing celebration in Columbus Park this summer in June, on June uh, 25th. Um, and she said, I felt informed after this program. I got to learn about Asian Chinese women's work history, which I don't see in the media. I mostly see American women's work history, such as the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory accident. Being a woman of color, seeing how other women of color pr protested for their rights makes me grateful for the rights I have. And she, and I think a lot of young people um, who aren't from Chinatown uh, were kind of captured by the stories that we've been able to present uh, in these 1982 exhibits and programs. And I just want to say I have learned so much in the process, and May has been an extraordinary teacher along the way. So, <laughs> thanks. Okay, so yeah, thank you, Rachel. Thank, thank you to all of the speakers in the panel. I think there's uh, a variety of experiences and perspectives to bring to the audience, and I want to hand this back to Neil to um, deal with any questions. I guess there are a few questions in the Q&A. Yes, oh, thank you so much, uh, May. Um, so actually, I think they are actually, uh, we, are, we have about um, four different, actually they are more like a comment, but I think, you know, I would just love to, um, you know, kind of read them out loud, um, you know, kind of for our audience. But also if you do have questions, you know, please feel free to, um, you know, submit them, to, um, whether it be in the chat or in the Q&A. So um, this one's from um, participant T. Joe, um, mentioning hope we can participate in this event here at the Brooklyn Public Library, in New York City Histor History Day Contest 2023. National History Day, it's a program that provides over half a million students each year the opportunities to excel at historic research, interpretation, and creative expression. So we have a second um, comment from Vivian Toy. Um, you know, she said, Thank you so much for this program. It brings back wonderful memories. My mother, Louise Toy, was a garment worker and on the executive board of Local 2325. 
I had a summer job at local 2325, 2325 in 1982, and I worked a phone bank urging government workers to attend the rally. And I was at the rally as a staff worker. It was all inspiring to see Columbus Park filled with ladies just like my mom, united in spirit and power. And then we have another comment from Adelina Kavana. My mother was a government worker until she retired in the early 2000s, moving from Chinatown to Midtown Government District. Can anyone tell me who took this photograph in this article? It's the first photograph. My mother is in the polka dots on the left. So, um, you know, I think, mm -hmm, I think we can, yeah, you know, later kind of, yeah, click on the link and trying to identify it. Um, and then, yeah, we have, you know, and then, yeah, and then continuing, um, you know, her comment. Um, I remember marching the Labor Day parade in 1997 when I was a rising junior in college. It was amazing to see all the ladies that look like my mother marching. So mm -hmm. here's, you know, the, the, the four comments. Um, and let me just double check. Um, if there's any question. Oh, and then we do have um, one question from um, Barry um, Grunberg. Do the workers get lunch hours or vacation time? So that's the question. Yes, they, the workers did have lunch hours. And um, for better or worse, the peace rate system allowed workers, well, I mean, there was urinary tract problems, as June alluded to, but it also gave the workers a little bit of flexibility in the sense when they finished a bundle or they did a certain amount of work, some of the workers would go and pick their kids up after school and either bring them back to the factory or take them home. And during the lunch hours, um, they did often eat in the factory. Most of the factories had a big rice cooker. And so the factory provided rice and most of the workers brought in you know, leftovers and things that in the old days, they would heat up on the radiators <laughs> And when the microwave oven was created, they would line them up and warm them up in the microwave. Um, yeah, so, I mean, one of the big sharing things within the factory, there was a real social life within the factory. And I really felt like June's mom was one of the social butterflies in the shop um, because they, they did have these lunch hours and even in my own experience as a staff person in the union, the women had a lot of very good advice to share with people. And this was usually during lunch hours or breaks about how to juggle doing a job that was very demanding and had long hours and taking care of your children. Like there was always a pay phone in the factory and most of the kids were expected to call their mom when they got home from school. I mean, these were like latchkey kids and they would call and, you know, I mean, there were a lot of kind of cultural things like that that dealt with, you know, women and the shops. So um, I remember once going to the shop to just publicize some union event, like giving out flyers and stuff like that. And it was near Chinese New Year. And there was this Chinese guy with this huge paper carton full of chickens that he was bringing into the factory to sell to the workers. Because, you know, on Chinese New Year, it's very traditional that every family has to have a whole chicken and it includes the head and the tails, really feet, the whole thing. And so he was going from machine to machine and the workers were checking them out and picking out a chicken that they could cook for Chinese New Year. So um, there was this, I mean, there's this image of the sweatshop and the long hours and the heat and, you know, all those conditions and they are real. But then on the flip side, there were these social relationships and, you know, activities and the union did have a vacation check that was given every year to workers. And so there were different benefits that the workers got um, because these were union shops. You know, May, you, you made me laugh because I remember the chicken guy, the chicken man that came up to the factory. Um, you know, and my brother reminded me that there were nights when my mom would, you know, get home a little later because by that time I was already out of the house. You know, it was my younger brother reminded me 
and and it wasn't because she was working it was because she was enjoying her time with her her friends playing mahjong in the factory because that's when they had a little time you know at the work to sit together and play a little mahjong because usually i mean they're working six days a week so so just to find that little bit of time to enjoy each other's company was so important to them mm -hmm. Thank you so much um, for sharing. And then I think we do have, um, well, there's another, yeah, we do have another um, questions from Sydney Stewart. Um, Sydney asked, it was mentioned that 9-11 uh, was a turning point in terms of the number of garment industry jobs. May you speak about what industries the workers end up working in after? Right, I mean, 9-11 was really traumatic for Chinatown and for the garment industry because Chinatown was in the so-called frozen zone. And I remember being out on the street, you know, when workers were trying to get past these national guardsmen with machine guns, just to go back to their factory to collect their tools or collect their paychecks and stuff like that. And they couldn't communicate because a lot of the, um, even the FEMA um, relief people had never worked in a community that was like such an immigrant area like New York City. Um, and then the people who were trying to ship the goods in and out, you know, like with little trucks and vans and whatever, they weren't able to get their garments um, out of the shop if they were finished or the piece goods into the shop for production. So essentially 9-11 really shut down the industry. And during the post 9-11 period, there were numerous um, funded job training programs, which started a process of moving a lot of workers into doing home care, like home health aids, uh, food making, like wrapping dumplings or, you know, making different types of frozen food and stuff like that. Um, and that process began after 9-11. Sadly, I mean, a lot of the employers were very angry with the union because they felt we were enabling these job training people to take their workers away from the industry. But really, you know, it was, it was a real double-edged sword because the um, workers needed to have jobs and they needed to make money and they needed to find work other, you know, knowing the garment industry was really um, on its last legs. I mean, the but, women, um, yeah, the women, um, went into the home care and, 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 and as you said, they, um, making dumplings. But for the, I think for many of the men, they pivoted to security jobs, you know, mm -hmm. security. So it was a whole new learning um, process for them. You know, having work in a garment factory, but now learning something totally new, you know, being a security guard. Um, Many of them, you know, um, went through training programs through CMP um, mm -hmm. so they, they can learn new skills post 9-11. And many of them went into the security kind of work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and then, yeah, there's uh, um, um, another question, you know, by the um, an attendee um, asked about what other union groups at the time supportive of the movement? Uh, yes, I would say the union, the ILGWU was quite successful at getting other unions supporting, as well as community organizations who initially were afraid to so-called take sides on this issue, but gradually realized that the importance of these workers and the fact that so many workers turned out, there were two rallies and so many workers turned out for the first rally that following that, it was just very clear that the workers wanted the benefits of unionization and wanted to stick with the union and to get that union contract resolved. Great, thank you so much. Um, and then another questions um, by um, A. Chen and then um, asked, what hours did the seamstresses work? Um, what were 
what they paid. I've heard it's by piece sewn and not a lot of money paid per piece. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, June, do you want to respond to that or? I, in, in turn, I don't know how much per piece and it depends on the garment. I think the, the more complicated garment call for a, a, a higher amount. In terms of the hours, the working hours, it can go into the night. Depending if there's a rush, um, oftentimes there's a rush to complete and many of the women would have to stay leave. So there's no really set hours. Um, definitely they're in um, by nine o'clock in the morning. Uh, I remember mom coming home sometimes eight o'clock or nine o'clock sometimes. And again, it depends on um, how, how, how much of a rush to get that lot of clothes um, completed. So I, I don't believe there was a set like nine to five kind of shift. And again, because it's by piece, the more you put out, the more money you make. And the more complicated the pieces, I think you um, earn more. I, I actually we should add the piece rate is um, as very ingenious system invented by garment manufacturers and sometimes it's the piece is the garment but sometimes it's a piece like it's per zipper or per buttonhole you know or per side seam because uh, each seamstress is not necessarily making the whole garment they might be just putting in a zipper and it could be just pennies for each piece. And the problem with piece rate is that on the one hand, uh, some workers feel that there's benefits because if they work more, they get more money. Uh, and there's also some flexibility like June was talking about, they could take a break in the middle of the day or something like that. But the problem with piece rate also is that the employers are always recalculating the rate and it's always downward. So um, this is called uh, in, 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 in industrial <laughs> studies, this is called uh, speed up, where you have to um, work, you have to make more pieces to make the same amount of money. So it's, it's, a, it's a very um, complicated system where uh, it has some flexibility and rewards uh, people who work more uh, and things like that. But at the, I think at the end of the day, uh, it's, it's insidious because uh, the piece rate's always going down. Yeah, I, I should add that the union had to um, struggle very hard with a lot of these issues related to wages and hours, because theoretically in the union contract, the piece rate was supposed to add up to the union's contractual minimum wage right. per hour. Right, there's a, and there's then, a floor. Um, <laughs> there's yeah, supposed to be a floor, work, right. Yeah, work beyond a certain number of hours in a week is supposed to be paid at overtime. Um, but in Chinatown, I think there are two real big problems. One is that the position of the Chinese factories were all contractors. They were, I think that was mentioned by May Nye and others, they were working for um, manufacturers and brand labels that gave them these work orders. And they negotiated a price for doing 5,000 pieces for the Gap or whoever it is. And they were paid this much money. And so then within that, they had to parse out the money for, you know, paying for each section of the garment, the zipper or the sleeve or the, you know, and, and then for their rent and overhead and then for whatever their profit was going to be. So they operated on, and, and the contract system, it has very, very low profit margin. The, the big money in the garment industry is by the brands or the designers or you know, all the, the Met Gala, you know, the glitz and glamour people. But these are really at the bottom of an industrial system that um, where the workers are really at the bottom paid by piece rate. So I think it's a very hard question to answer. Um, with the union did have a rule that barred work on Sundays. And then in the 1990s, when we saw a lot of shops opening on Sunday, because that's when they had the work that had to be shipped out, um, we started to try to patrol it and go to the shops and tell the workers to go home and you know, take a day off, you know, whatever. 
And some workers were happy that we came in, but many other workers were not that happy. And so, you know, it's a very um, complex uh, environment. And I have to say that it was a lot of push and pull and a lot of surprises to me where, you know, you think things have to operate on this system and the law says this and this, and then the reality is something else. So um, I think we all struggle the best we can and we try to get the workers themselves to understand what should be enforced and what their rights are and try to um, do their best. The other, the other thing about um, the, the system which hasn't been mentioned is homework. Many people had industrial singers in their homes and they took piecework home. And so they would, you know, go home, cook dinner for their kids, get them to bed, and then they would be sewing into the wee hours of the night. So, um, you know, it, it's in some ways of, uh, and that's the very common practice. I mean, it's not 100%, but it's a very, very common practice for women to take work home, or what they call homework to do. My mother-in-law did that. We, we still have that singer sewing in the basement. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, we have another question. Um, so Jenny Law asks, were interviews and or oral histories made of the Chinese or non-Chinese garment shop owners to get their perspective uh, regarding this movement? Why would imagine they were caught between a rock mm -hmm. and a hard place trying to provide their large corporate clients competitive price garments, but then also satisfy the demands of the labels? Well, I think probably Yue can answer this the best because she manages the archives, but I can say that they have a very interesting oral history by the um, garment owner who used to be in the Mocha building, you know, in, in Center Street, and what his experience was in the industry and things like that. He's not Chinese, though, but he was part of the old... Um, you know, kind of, he talks about the, the dynamic between the Jewish and Italian garment owners and kind of their friendship, but their com competition with each other. And then the influx then of the Chinese employers. Um, I worked on a um, project with the Lower East Side Tenement Museum. And we had a um, garment contractor, Wing Ma, who used to be on the board of MOCA who was, who's been very, very helpful and informative from the employer perspective of what it was like to be a contractor in Chinatown and what, what that experience was. It's, it's really a fascinating story that it, if it can be documented in the archives of MOCA, I think it's a very rich body of information. Yes, I, I think this is also can be considered a very good suggestion for us to continue collect our oral history to kind of uh, reach out to Chinese, non-Chinese, the owner of the garment shop to to enrich to reach our uh, you know uh, enrich our uh, oral history collection on garment factory worker. But off top of my head, I think the two oral history uh, we uh, um, select for this presentation were really the garment worker uh, leaders for the the rally. Uh, and and also I remember on the Sunset Park uh, project they were. Uh, also, our history just like interview the garment worker themselves. But this is a really uh, good suggestion we definitely will consider, especially during this 40th anniversary. And we will develop more our history content with the interviewees. If I, I can just add something to um, the comment about uh, the contractors being uh, in a difficult position. Uh, that's true. And that is actually a, st a structural problem uh, in contracting. Um, because uh, on the one hand, to get the job, you have to put in a low bid. And the lower your bid, the less you have to pay the workers. So um, that is a pr 
perennial problem. Um, and that is where the term sweating comes from, the sweatshop. It's not the sweat from the worker's brow. It's the sweating, it's the squeezing of the guy in the middle of the, of the small shop owner, the, the contractor. And that's a term that goes back to the early 20th century um, in the Lower East Side with, with the garment shops. So sweated, sweated labor is, is the labor that's performed uh, in these shops where um, the employers have uh, underbid uh, each other to the point where they cannot even afford to pay their workers. And in Chinatown, it was actually very common uh, in the 80s and 90s and even later for shops to just close not pay their workers for a month and then just close and disappear and then maybe pop up somewhere else with a different name, but the same boss, you know, so, um, and the New York State Labor Department is supposed to police uh, these things of, you know, wage theft and uh, things like that, but they don't have enough uh, employees. They don't have enough inspectors because uh, the, the shops are all over the place. But there have been there have been some lawsuits, I believe, and there have been back wages won back by people who, by employers who just close up their shops. So this is a perennial problem, um, and it's and it's a way that I think historically, the garment industry has exploited immigrant women uh, from the very beginning, going back a hundred years or, or one hundred and twenty years to the Lower East Side with Jewish women and then Italian women. And then in the 50s and 60s, Black and Puerto Rican women, and then um, Chinese and Latina women. It's always been um, this. And, and it's interesting because to the extent that garment manufacturing has um, moved overseas, right? I mean, we, we all see like Walmart, all these big companies, they have this, you know, it's, it's a global kind of sweating system. Right, um, you know, it was always it was to China, but now it's not even in China. Now they've gone to even cheaper areas like Cambodia or Bangladesh. So you have um, workers all over the world really competing with with each other uh, in this race to the bottom. So I think that that is a problem in the industry that um, you know is very long standing and it doesn't seem to be going away very quickly. So I think for um, organizations like the ILGWU to organize in that environment is very challenging. It's very, very challenging. And um, I don't want to tell tales out of school, but you know, there were there were debates and arguments in the labor movement. It was like, should we be organizing a dying industry, right? Those people actually thought they should go after some new new kind of uh, uh, sectors of the of the workforce. And I think if you're a Chinese garment worker, that would be very hard news to hear that, um, you know, you, you were considered part of a dying industry that wasn't worth the, the time of the, of the organized labor movement. And so, you know, uh, organized labor has many challenges uh, in this last generation with deindustrialization and production moving offshore. Um, and the garment industry is one example of that. Thank you so much. Um, I think we'll only have, you know, three more minutes. So maybe, you know, um, I know we do have probably, you know, another like one or two questions, but actually I do want to give some time, you know, to our panelists, you know, if you want to kind of just share any final thoughts or any closing remarks, uh, May, would you like to, um, yeah, you know, share um, yeah, some of your final thoughts? If you, like. you mean May Nai or May Chen? <laughs> um, no, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> maybe, how, how about we start with you? Yeah, May Nai. Yeah, Professor Nai. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I think this has been a wonderful conversation, um, and I really appreciate uh, the archival work that uh, Mocha is doing, and Mei Chen's experience, and Junji's experience, and Rachel's uh, incredible documentation of, of workers' uh, voices and, and their participation. So thank you, Mocha, for organizing this. I just want to make one comment that kind of circles back to something I mentioned earlier which is that I think the importance of the union for uh, Chinese garment workers was not only that they defended and organized them to defend their rights in the workplace, right? Uh, for their benefits, for their working conditions, uh, which are always in these very difficult circumstances, but also the union was a way, it was, it was a social world. It was beyond even having lunch together 
and hanging out together and, you know, it, women working together is always um, an incredible experience, but also through the organization of the union itself, it's educational. People learn about things. They learn about, you know, the union had um, citizenship classes, you know, for people who wanted to become naturalized citizens. So through the union, uh, workers not only were able to mobilize for their own rights, but they, but beyond their workplace rights, they were able to be democratic citizens, active in building our democracy. And I think that is something that we don't have enough of anymore because the labor movement has declined. We don't have enough of these organizations in the community who do this kind of work. And so I think when we want to, when we think today about defending our democracy, which I believe is in deep, deep peril, um, we need to have not just people mobilize, but we need to have organizations that can mobilize them, educate them, mobilize them, give them a path to express themselves. They have good ideas, but they don't always have a way to express them. So I think one of the great things to learn, in my view, from the 1982 strike was the power, not just of the workers, but power of workers who are organized. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you so much. So maybe, yeah, maybe Rachel, yeah, maybe would you like to yeah, share some of your um, final thoughts? Sure, well, I, um, I share May's appreciation of everybody who contributed here. It's so impressive. Um, and I 100% agree with what May and I just said about the importance of organizing. And I think a piece of that to me is there's so many people who in this day and age really don't know what a union is or what it does. And these stories about unions teaching English classes and helping um, with naturalization process and immigration papers are just are so important. And they're so revealing when people hear about them. So let's keep on um, sharing these stories. And um, I just also want to add, after three years, uh, on hiatus, there's going to be a Labor Day parade this year yeah. on September 10th at 10 a.m. And it's been 140 years since the first Labor Day parade in 1882. So I will leave everybody with that as something to consider. And thank you so much, Mary Chen. Thank you so much, Rachel, for sharing. Um, yeah, June, yeah, would you like to? Um, yes, I, I'm, it's what May and Rachel said. Um, it's such a pleasure to be you know, on this panel. I actually learned something to myself. Um, I was just perusing through the chat and the Q&A, and I noticed so many people um, um, saying how this brought back so, so much you know, for them. I would hope after today that many of you all, all of you, consider doing your own oral history. It is so important that we capture it while we have it. Um, as, I was, uh, as I mentioned, as I was preparing for this, I had to go back and dig deep down into my memory and there were missing parts. Uh, and those who had the, that information are no, no longer with us. So for those who are on this call, on this, this um, webinar here, um, please consider um, doing your own oral history. It, it can mean a lot for you yourself or even, even the greater community. Um, so that's all I wanted to add. Thank you. Thank you so much, June. Um, yeah, would you like to share some final thoughts? Uh, yes. First, I would like to thank you, all uh, panelists. I have learned a lot from you, and thank you for being here uh, at the MOGA. This is a wonderful pre presentation. And on the other side, um, you know, it's like when I got any like a phone call about a sewing machine, and every like for me, it's like every clothes, every sewing machine, every you know item, there is a, a you know wonderful family story behind it. And from the Q and A and the chart, I also see a lot of family stories over there. So from this pro 
program, I really feel like there are a lot of work to do for us to collect more um, garment factory workers uh, uh, story from all these families and uh, from all those, you know, uh, organizers, um, manufacturers. And also on the other side, we will, you know, work hard to kind of tell the story and put them online and uh, for researchers all over the world. Uh, and, uh, you know, we uh, do really appreciate all your attendees as well uh, to be in this program. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, yeah. May, would you like to just to yeah, share some closing remarks as we wrap up the program? <laughs> well, people have already said pretty much all, all of my feelings. I want to thank MOCA and all the panelists and all the participants. Uh, this has been a really great conversation. And I think to me, one of the main lessons of the 1982 and the working so many years in the union is the power in our collective voices and our collective strength and the solidarity. So yeah, there is a Labor Day parade on Saturday and my union is marching and you should look for your unions if you have one. And um, if you don't, just come out onto Fifth Avenue above 45th Street and watch us march up the street. <laughs> but um, also I think there's been a lot said and done in the last couple of years to uh, about essential workers. And I think that's very important um, and we should not forget them. And having unions and uh, like our experience in local 2325 gave voice to the workers themselves to speak up and to command respect. And we need to keep doing that and keep organizing. So thanks everybody and thanks Neil and Lauren and Harvey, you know, and all your back uh, back of the webinar <laughs> friends to make this happen. Thank you. May I? I just want to ask if you can tell at, tell everyone how to go about doing oral history if they're interested. Can you can you sort of give everyone some information? Um. Yes, we did our history either by project or just uh, generally for uh, the uh, we call uh, wave of identity uh, project or others like by project. For example, if we do a fashion show, we uh, interview uh, the fashion designer. If we do a, a food show, we interview chefs. But but that's like a different project. But in general, we do we did uh, conduct interview with a general uh, community to tell story about their family. So just uh, connect to us uh, by uh, sending email or call us to collections at mogaNYC.org. We have our workshop the new workshop at Sri Harvard. On the second floor, we create uh, our history booths so that we can conduct our history from there. We haven't started yet, but I hope uh, yeah, one of you will you know, start uh, our, our history booths to conduct a new oral history at Sri Harvard. So collections at mogaNYC.org. Great. Well, so um, yeah, once again, thank you so much um, for attending tonight's program. Um, if you have any additional questions or suggestions for the event, um, please feel free to send them directly to info at mocanyc.org. And if you do enjoy the program, please feel free to, you know, go to um, uh, Moka's website um, on the Get Involved, uh, make, uh, you know, um, um, any, you know, donations to support um, programs like this um, in the, for the future. And then this event um, is also being recorded and it will be a um, available for on-demand viewing um, on Mocha's YouTube channel um, by next week. Um, so once again, you know, we'd love to just on behalf of Mocha, um, giving a really heartfelt thank you to all our wonderful panelists, um, you know, uh, Mei Chen, Professor Nai, June, um, Yue, Rachel, thank you so much for your time. And then we hope that we will be able to, you know, um, continue with uh, more program like this. Um, thank you so much. Good night.